Hello guys, am I audible and visible? I'm just, uh, we'll just start the session if I'm audible and visible. If I'm audible as well as visible, just give me a note that say hi or something. Good evening everyone. So today what, you're going, to, what you're going to do is we're going to discuss about uh, the second session of the 10 series of IBQs. We had discussed one yesterday. So we'll be discussing one today. Tomorrow will be one more session in the YouTube and then we'll have subsequent session in the Unacademy app, right? So hopefully we hopefully most of you have attended the last yesterday session. If you've not done that, please go to the Unacademy app and all of them are special classes which will, might be useful for you for the upcoming NEET exam, okay? So today we are going to go with the second session of IBQs. Uh, so am I audible and visible? Let me know. Fine. The routine goes as usual. So we're going to look at the question and then I want you to comment on the answer. Then we'll go for a logical explanation of the question and something related to the topic, right? I just want to go a bit depth in understanding of the topic. So it'll be useful for your, any question which comes related to that topic, fine? Okay, and these are the free test series in an academy. Okay, thank you, Shiv. So you can attend it whenever you want and there are a few targeted batches for you. Whichever batch might suit you, you might go for that, fine? Okay, so let's go ahead. There's a first question here. Read the question and do comment on the answer. You, you know, you don't know, doesn't matter. Just comment on the answer. We'll look at all the options as well as we'll look at this diagnosis in particular in detail, fine? Okay, so time starts now. What do you think is the answer? I do want you guys to comment if it's fine, right or wrong, doesn't matter. Okay, Shiv went for, uh, went for Pew Jigger Polo. Anyone else wants to add? Okay, Apollo, we'll go through the question and we'll have a look at it. I think the reason Shiv went for Pew Jigger Polo is this part. One thing, it kind of looks like a tree. And one more thing, it's there given in Jejunum, right? Because Jejunum is one of the most common sites of Pew Jigger Polo, fine? So I have an image here. <coughs> The, the question reads that histologically it consists of a glands containing both absorptive goblet cells supported by a stalk, right? Excuse me, fine. See, when you have a stalk, I'm just going to go and uh, let us understand what is in sessile polyp and what's in pedunculated polyp. If this is the surface of an intestine, when I have something like this, a polyp without a stalk, I call them a sessile polyp, fine? When I have something Again, the normal intestine, I have something like a stalk and then I have a polyp, I call it a pedunculated polyp, right? I just want you to understand the difference between these two because uh, the mistake of calling this stalk a pute jigger might be wrong sometime. Fine, just a second. Okay. So what made you think of pute jigger or should have answered pute jigger is the appearance, right? The appearance looks like a Christmas tree, fine. Sorry for it. It looked like Christmas tree. Now, just looking at this pedunculated polyp, am I right in saying that this pedunculated polyp also will this part also have smooth muscle? Will you have smooth muscle in this part? There's a stalk. Will there be smooth muscle in this part? It will be supposed to will have smooth muscle, right? So don't consider this smooth muscle as a part of the pubic polyp, right? Because it's totally different, right? This smooth muscle is normal seen in any pedunculated polyp, right? So when I will call it pudgecker polypus, when I have the smooth muscle in the glandular surface, sorry, it's getting stuck again. When I have smooth muscle in the glandular surface, I can call it a, a pudgecker polyp. So how will it look is, just give me a second. Some Jeff error. Sorry. Just give me a second. Okay. Start back. Hopefully, it will not get interrupted again. So if you have a smooth muscle in the polypoidal area, then I'll call it a pudgecker polyp, fine? That's the main difference between this diagnosis and the pudgecker polyp, right? I'll go to the image again here. When you look at this image, 
I do have smooth muscle here. I do accept that, right? This entire part is smooth muscle. But when I take the polypodal surface, this is my polypodal surface here. Am I seeing smooth muscle in this surface? I don't have smooth muscle here. I don't have smooth muscle here. I don't have smooth muscle here, right? So it's not a pure checker polyp, right? So pure checker polyp will have a very close differential. It's a very close differential diagnosis, obviously. But there's one more characteristic finding seen here. If I zoom this polyp a little bit, or you can see appreciate here as well. When I look at this polyp, okay, I think I'll have to use a different software. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. Okay, great. So if you look at this here, in this part, the polyp is kind of serrated, right? Though I'm having the finding here, this is like a villous lesion. I have lots of serrations here, right? That's diagnostic of this condition called as a serrated adenoma, right? So we're going to discuss something in and around serrated adenoma. So when I say serrated adenoma, there are two findings in serrated adenoma. One is the serration, and I'm sure the serrations are much, much more visible in this section. I find this some one thing which came to our lab. You can see the deep serrations here, right? I'm going to give a logical reasoning for the deep serration so that you will never forget how a serration will look and how I'm going to identify the serrations, fine? Again, we just need general pathology knowledge, very basic knowledge for us to understand about any compli complicated pathogenesis. Serrated adenoma is a component seen in HNPCC, fine, or a Lynch syndrome. What do you think is the pathogenesis of Lynch syndrome? Whatever comes to your mind. I'm sure all of you must have known this. The pathogenesis of Lynch syndrome, we have something called as microsatellite instability or methyl mismatch repair, right? That's a pathogenesis of Lynch syndrome, fine. So in, in Lynch syndrome or in serrated adenoma, my problem is my MMR, methyl mismatch repair defect. Or I call them microsatellite instability. We uh, some other day we'll discuss about microsatellite instability in detail. Right? When I say methyl mismatch repair defect, it's a type of a DNA repair which is defective in this patient. Right? So let's take a normal intestinal epithelium. Let's assume this is a normal intestinal epithelium. Every normal intestinal epithelium will have two structures like these. I want you to name the structure. What are these called as? And what is this called as? We have two structures. Right. So one, this is the upward pro, uh, pro, projection and the downward elongation, right? I have a crypt and I have a villi, right? So if you see a crypt and a villi, if you remember your normal general histology and your anatomy, which part of this intestinal epithelium you will have stem cells in the crypt or in the villi? You'll have stem cells in the villi, right? So I'm just going to have villi. In villi only, I'll have stem cells. All the stem cells of a normal intestinal epithelium will be in the villi only, right? So if I take that, can I say that in any normal intestine, there will be a constant proliferation of cells because intestinal epithelium comes under a group of labile cells, right? They are always constantly in a cell division, right? So what happens here is from a villi, let's assume there's a cell in the villi, it divides the stem cell, the blue dot, it divides, it goes here, it goes here, it goes here, right? So whatever cell is formed will be formed in the villi only. They gradually get transported to my crypt, uh, will be formed in the crypt only. They gradually get transported to my villi. That's how normally it happens. Let's assume I'm having a stem cell which is multiplying randomly. Very fastly it's multiplying. Is there a chance there can be an error? Definitely there can be error, right? That's where my methyl mismatch repair comes. If there's an error during the stem cells division, my MMR corrects that. Let's assume a patient with a Lynch syndrome, the MMR is not able to correct the problem, right? Again, we'll just go and have a much detailed look so that I can understand why I have this serrated adenoma, right? So this is in villi, have the crypt. The crypt is producing cells. The crypt is producing actually more number of cells. All these cells came to my villi. Let's assume a few of these cells in the villi are abnormal. Whenever I have a cell with a mutation, which is not being corrected by my methyl mismatch repair, which is assuming I'm having a cell with a mutation which is not getting corrected by my methyl mismatch repair, right? So can I say that that cell is a weak cell and it will undergo apoptosis? It will, it should, right? So let's say that I'll draw a shade two of them or three of them here as in red color. All these red color cells came from my stem cells which are defective, so it will automatically die by apoptosis, right? So if that is true, what will happen to this villi is, I'll have the same villi, right? But as I said that there are two cells which are gone here. Rest, everything is fine. 
again here two cells are gone does this destroyed area looks like in serration or in other words can i it will look like this right they going to look like serrations right because the defective thing uh, swadhi it will be in the crypt right it will be in the crypt only and then the cell moves to the villi fine so this looks like a serrations so serrations are nothing but the lost epithelium which are defective because my methyl mismatch repair is not able to correct them fine so let's uh, that's first finding that's my serrations the second finding is based on my crypt so i'm saying that stem cell are the one which are going to produce lots and lots of cells right that's the function of any stem cell here so here this stem cell also produces lots of cells plus there is a repair whenever there is a repair or a defect in the production i'm going to give more stem cells more proliferation right so when the proliferation increases what happens to my crypt is it will get distorted right that's the second finding it i won't have a crypt like this i'll have a villi with serrations and the crypt might become a u shaped one or an l shaped one like this right because this crypt will have an increased proliferation because it's a defect which is going to be neoplastic transformation more proliferation and abnormal shape right these are very two characteristic finding one is my serrations other is my crypt distortion okay these both are characteristic of your serrated adenoma right and you can see in this will like there's a normal adenoma where i have lots of crypt destruction here right they're just destroyed and the villi the cells are having lots of serrations right so this finding here is suggest of an serrated adenoma right <coughs> sorry so we had a quick look about your serrated adenoma the pathogenesis now i want to extrapolate the same thing to identify something which you must have read in your uh, um, surgery as well as in your pathology the right side colonic lesions and the left side colonic lesions right so when i take hnpcc hnpcc related cancer colon cancer will happen in the right side of the colon or left side of the colon i am sure you know that you let me know that and based on that we will try to extrapolate how it is right side and how it is left side fine any hnpc associated colon cancer will be in the right side or left side which you already know it means right or left it will be most commonly the right side of colonic lesion right your generalized apc beta cadet and pathway will be in the left side and normal hnpc related one will be in the right side of the colon right so generally hnpc related cancer will be the right side colon cancer when i take right side of colon that's my ascending colon and the half of transverse colon what do you think is the function what do you think is the function of a right side of colonic cancer a uh, uh, general colon not cancer general colon i'm going to absorb more right left side colon the main function is going to be stool compaction and the formation of feces that's all right side colon absorbs more in other words can i say that in a right side the villi will be more distributed than in the left side colon which is just going to absorb yes If there are lots of villi, the surface area is more. Am I right in saying that the amount of production or replacement of the cells will be more in the right side? Yes, right side colon absorbs water. Yeah, will be more in the right side, right? So in right side, my stem cells in the crypt are overactive compared to my left side. Yes or no? Because left side doesn't have much role of absorption. Yes, that's also correct. If so, right side colon crypt produces more amount of cells. can i say that in a patient with a methyl mismatch repair defect there is a chance that one of these divisions can become abnormal and become malignant it should right so that's the reason hnpc related colon cancer are always on the right side so whenever i see a right side colon cancer i think that there is a repair defect associated because there is lots of proliferation happening there right so i'll be able to explain most every finding when i know the pathogenesis right so mmr defect is the pathogenesis of both serrated adenoma as well as hnpc if this is true we'll kind of again try to extrapolate more you must have read about lin syndrome right what is the criteria for lin syndrome there is a name criteria i'm sure most of the surgeons love the criteria they have told you there is a criteria called as amsterdam's criteria do you remember them there is an amsterdam's criteria in amsterdam's criteria we have not just colon cancer there is one more cancer which is very commonly seen in lin syndrome what cancer is that if you can recollect again i can give a logical explanation why that cancer particularly apart from colon cancer there is one more cancer which is called as lynch associated cancer or lynch syndrome associated cancer colon cancer plus the other one is i'm sure you must have heard them endometrial cancer right the other one is endometrial cancer the same problem when i take endometrium okay, am i right in saying that in endometrium also there is lots of proliferation happening 
this every cycle every 14 days is going to get replaced it'll die it'll get replaced it'll die it'll get replaced it'll die so lots of proliferation happens in and out if it happens in and out can i say that there are also my methyl mismatch repair defect uh, gene is very very important because lots of proliferation there's chance of an error repair must is must if it is not happening i have a chance of an endometrial carcinoma as well right again it's related to my pathogenesis i don't put any other cancer most of the syndromes are related to the pathogens only fine that's the first image for us serrated adenoma and we read something related to serrated adenoma okay all right we go to the next question again i wanted to comment it's fine if you answer it wrongly doesn't matter at all it's just a learning exercise for us fine do comment on the question and then we'll start the discussion here Okay, answer. You can make a guess. It's completely fine. Okay, B, fine. Anyone else? Subkalyan has gone for B. I want you to comment. It's fine if you are wrong. Okay, Swati has gone for dilated cardiomyopathy. Great. Anyone else? Okay, this this MCQ is purposefully meant for you to know where to look for. That's all right. See, whatever happens is uh, we always have a pre-set uh, notion that okay, when I have a heart, I am going to have something related to the myocardium only. That's what we always think, right? Because INACT had a question on HOCM, NEET has had a question on HOCM, so we generally think that okay, my myocardium related problem will be there. When you have an heart, yes, myocardium related problem is very very important. I want you to look at few things. One, obviously, look at the chambers. Never forget the chambers. Look at the chambers first. Second, obviously, I want to look at the septum, right? third please don't forget to look at the valve and that's more important for me i have to look at the valve as well right so when you look at this valve here here this uh, this side is my left ventricle it's a larger one it's a left ventricle it's just twist uh, turn that's all right and when you look at this valve you have how many cusps are you having there three or two i'm having two cusps there right that's a bicuspid aortic valve right I just want you to make sure you have to look at every possible parts, right? My septum important, papillary muscle important. At the same time, valve is also important. Don't miss the valves, right? Because valvular pathology is important. I can have calcification in the valve, right? There are many, many things which can happen in the valves. I want you to have a quick look at it, all of them, fine? So here it's a bicuspid aortic valve. It's not an aortic dissection. Dissection will be a tear. I'll see a tear in the aorta. I'm not seeing any tear in the aorta here. It's just a bicuspid aortic valve. I can have calcification in the aortic valve. That's a common MCQ. You should look for them. You can you have a gross image for that in Robbins. Don't miss them. You can have your balloon aortic valve, right? You might um, you'll have a click uh, on auscultation and a balloon aortic valve. That's also myxomatous degeneration aortic valve. That's also a spotter. Third, you can have vegetations. Right? Please don't miss them. So valvular pathology is also very important. So all these can come in MCQ, right? You can have a heart with an infective endocarditis related vegetation. It could be destroying everything. So please ignore, include my valve as well. Don't ignore them, right? So it's a case of a bicuspid bus aortic valve. That's all, right? So as a 46 year old person presented to the emergency room, complaints of shark back pain during evaluation became unresponsive and subsequently died, right? Autopsy showed hemocardium. Based on the image, which of the following is the underlying process which explains it, right? So this history here, suggests of an aortic dissection understood right underlying process which explains the pathogenic finding in the figure here here my bicuspid aortic valve is more important i don't have something such of aortic dissection here is the bicuspid aortic valve which i'm more worried about fine the history is something different what is asking is the underlying problem bicuspid aortic valve will lead to hypertension a lot there is more amount of hypertension definitely there's a risk of dissection fine it's an indirect link but you have to know it yeah as i said that the primary cause of death here will be dissection related but the thing which caused the dissection the etiology here is bicuspid aortic valve fine clear swati okay we have the third question read the question and then give an answer
comment on the answer okay first diagnosis tell me the diagnosis here and also comment on the answer as well fine so takshi has started it she has answered b anyone else anyone else wants to take a call first is my diagnosis the biopsy is liver as the question says the liver lesion is being excised and which of the following will be the diagnosis hemangioma great i want a more specific diagnosis is it capillary hemangioma or cavernous hemangioma capillary or cavernous you have a extremely large dilated space right so this is capillary or cavernous it has to be a cavernous hemangioma right so it's a hemangioma understood for sure it's in cavernous hemangioma when i have a cavernous hemangioma what do you think cavernous hemangioma is regress leave liver if it's in my skin will cavernous hemangioma regress they don't regress right they will not regress capillary hemangiomas in the face skin most of them regress with age cavernous hemangioma don't regress right here the cavernous hemangiomas are more common deep seated organ than in the skin in skin capillary hemangioma is more common so it doesn't commonly happen in the skin it happens in the subcutaneous tissue might be but internal organs like liver spleen and lip, uh, your lungs are more common locations of cavernous hemangioma hemangiomas generally don't become malignant it does has a risk of rupture but cancer transformation converting to angiosarcoma is very very less for my capillary as well as cavernous hemangioma though it's a bouncer this lesion can cause death how do you think a cavernous hemangioma can cause death it's a very dilated vascular channel in the liver trauma or spontaneously it can rupture when it ruptures there's a chance of rupture obviously when it ruptures it's going to cause hemoperitoneum that's going to become detrimental i can uh, you might have a hypovolemic shock lots of blood will be lost there it might have a hypovolemic shock and i can lose a patient as well fine keep this in mind can i do a biopsy in case of cavernous hemangioma yes or no is biopsy done or contraindicated for cavernous hemangioma it is contraindicated right biopsy is undoubtedly contraindicated in cavernous hemangioma this is from the resected mass yes it's an imaging based diagnosis with imaging the surgeon has to take a call resect it very carefully don't rupture it completely remove and throw it away it has to be operated it should not be left as like that if it, if you leave like that there's a risk of rupture infection is lower down the possibility and that's not main concerns worthy but rupture is a main concern i can lose the patient as well fine the next question again i want you to comment and let's see Yeah, yeah, I have, I have zoomed it out. I hope you can see the options now, Satakshi. Okay, any takers? We'll read the history. Fifty-one year old male with history of hypertension, which has pain, which just began, subsequently becomes unresponsive and cannot be resuscitated. A lethal lesion is found in the autopsy. Which of the following would be the most likely microscopic finding in the same area affected? Right. So this is an autopsy of an iota. If you want to help. right so what do you think is the possibility hypertension chest pain which just began and if i want to give you an extra clue the pain radiated to the back okay what do you what do you see in the iota this image here is an iota image of an iota what do you see here see anyone else wants to take a call it's fine if you're wrong this is an iota what do you see in the iota see is correct that it's actually you need not remove it okay can you see this finding in the iota here what is this there's definitely a very very visible tear there right there's a definitely a visible tear that's an aortic dissection okay so there's definitely an aortic dissection happening here it's a tear right a tear in the iota this how aortic dissection looks on a gross imaging fine it's just a tear in the iota the tear happens because the media is totally weak it's torn and the blood travels between media when i say aortic dissection it's nothing but there's a tear or there's an injury to the intima 
when you have an injury to intima the tunica media which is already weak you have a weak tunica media and due to the weak tunica media i am going to have the blood which is going to travel between the layers of tunica media fine when i see blood between layers of tunica media i am going to call it an aortic dissection right robins has clearly given all the images required for aortic dissection fine always the history is going to be an acute abdomen pain or an acute chest pain based on the location of the tear it's a thoracic aorta or an arch of aorta it's going to be chest pain abdomen aorta it will going to be an abdomen pain but more both of them will be radiated in the back there's a very classical finding of aortic dissection along with hemodynamic compromise fine i uh, see yellow color could be just a fatty lesion a fatty streak which is common in a person with who is 51 year old that's definitely common yellowish lesion which could be a fat that's all fine okay this here is in coronary ostia uh, the vessels go with that the dot yeah the dot there is in coronary ostia the origin of a vessel fine okay so this is an image from robins if you look at this this is in vvg stain vvg stain is an elastic tissue stain when you see elastic tissue this definitely both these whatever i'm highlighting are elastic fibers you can see the parallel rays of black color right so in between the parallel rays of black color if you can appreciate this i do have lots of blood here so the parallel areas of black color here it's a tunica media so between the layers of tunica media i'm having an uh blood so blood between layers of tunica media that's a classical finding seen in aortic dissection that's the first image right and is a classification for aortic dissection what do you think is the classification of aortic dissection there are two classifications the older one is dba case like you can see in the bottom fine and the newer one is my stanford classification right both are divided on the same premise only the only advantage what deep of stanford had was stanford stanford was more of a clinical classification it is not an uh, anatomical classification fine i'll just look at the dbk first then we'll look at stanford fine so dbk 1 2 and 3 so it's based on the location of the tear that's all you can see the tear here and you can see the dissection happening from my aortic arch the root of aorta till your iliac vessels I have tear from the root of aorta till my iliac vessels, right, way down, right. So that's entire aorta getting torn. That's a DBK one classification. When you look at the DBK two, again I have tear from the root of aorta until the origin of the first vessel. When I have the tear only limited to the origin of the first vessel, that's DBK two, and here the tear starts beyond subclavian. When I have a tear beyond subclavian, that's DBK three. So the only disadvantage of DBK was DBK was totally an anatomical classification. Uh, DBK didn't consider the out outcome into place, right? Uh, so everything whatever you reach should be outcome based. If it's not outcome based, it automatically over the period of years will be eliminated. What Stanford did was converted DBK one and two to Stanford A, and converted DBK three into Stanford B. That's all. So Stanford is in more or less in uh, blood accumulates in the tunica media. Yes, Swati. Stanford is more of an prognostic based classification. If you say Stanford A is one and two, and Stanford B is three, which of these two do you think will have a better prognosis, one or two, or Stanford A or Stanford B? Stanford B will have a better prognosis, right? Or the DBK three will have a slightly better prognosis. I'm not saying I'll be able to save the patient completely. Just if properly treated, I'll be able to save the patient a little bit. Fine. DBK three or Stanford B will definitely have a better prognosis because in DBK. One and two, or in Stanford A, the root of the aorta is involved, which means can it spread to the heart? There is a possibility it can uh, spread to the heart, right? Fine. At same time, it can also uh, go along my central vessels. Fine. Okay. It can also go along the central vessels, so there is more risk of um, catastrophic complications. So I must stand Stanford A or DBK one and two will have a poor prognosis. Fine. Okay. Uh, welcome, Rajendra or Tanaksha. Who it is? Fine. The third finding is my question here. So here I am having a break in the intima, and everything goes into the media because my media is extremely weak. Right? There's one more image of VVG stain aorta picture only. Again, VVG is an elastic stain, and then VVG stain aorta picture. And we're going to look at this image, and we can easily extrapolate what's going to happen. Uh, what how I'm going to name this structure? Right? It's an aorta stain, a VVG staining aorta. I'm right in saying that it, the entire aorta is full of elastic fibers, right? So this image here is tunica media intima or adventitia of the aorta. Any vessel intima will have only your endothelium. So this entire thing is tunica media, right? 
have a tunica media here and when you look at the tunica media here I'm sure that you can see in degenerated area and I can see areas of cyst like degeneration right so I have some areas of cystic degeneration so we just named it in cystic medial degeneration right yeah cystic medial degeneration that's a finding seen in IoT dissection. That was MCQ, right? Just cyst like spaces of degeneration of the tunica media because of whatever may be the pathogenesis, right? There are two lesions, two diseases or etiologies which can cause cystic medial degeneration. Both hypertension, which can cause marfins, sorry, which can cause IoT dissection, can cause this. I'll tell Hashita just a second. And other one is marfins. Both marfins as well as your hypertension can cause cystic medial de degeneration and both of them can cause your IOT dissection fine okay great uh, we learned it now it's a microscopic finding it's a tunica media I cannot see the tunica media on a gross finding right so what do you think amongst these two is a uh, most common find uh, cause hypertension or marfans obviously hypertension right Obviously, hypertension is the most common cause of aortic dissection. Marfan's is definitely there, right? BBG stands for Verhoff, Van Gies, and Ashita, right? It's a, just a staining technique which is based on silver technology only. Anything based on silver will be black in color. It's Verhoff, Van Gies, and that's VVG, okay? That's about that question, fine? Right? For the next question, again, I wanted to comment. This is a very, very simple one. Uh, don't make mistakes in this question, fine? Right? Okay, answers. You shouldn't make a mistake here. This must have been the first case most of us must have seen or read or diagnosed on our own. Or some of us might be operating, uh, operated them during internship as well. A 16 year old presents to the emergency room with abdomen pain and began around the belly button. Now it's most likely in the right uh, side of the abdomen, which in other words is right iliac fossa. And what's the most likely diagnosis? This is an appendix. Right, you can see a finger leg pressure, and you can see maybe a pus collection there. Right, it's a classical case of an acute appendicitis. Right, it's more of a clinical diagnosis, it is definitely clinical diagnosis. My radiology might help me to sort the surrounding edema. I might have a neutrophilia, I can have a fever, everything. All these were put under a diagnostic scoring system. What is the score, scoring system called as? Great, Shukalya, it's D. You have something called as mantle scoring system, that's important for appendicitis. Appendicitis, surgical management, what you do for appendicular mass, everything is required. From pathology pers perspective, appendicitis is not a major cause, right? I Even if you give a microscopic finding, a Ranson is not for appendicitis, right? If I remember, Ranson is for pancreatitis. Mantles was appendicitis, right? So in a microscopy of appendicitis, what I'll see is, I'll see neutrophils. It's an acute condition, right? Neutrophils in the muscle layer. Yeah, ocean regimen is for your appendicular abscess or appendicular mass formation, right? Neutrophils in the muscle layer, the muscular is proper if we see them, that is diagnostic. I should not see neutrophils in the lumen. Lumen neutrophils is not important for me. It should be in the muscle layer. Only when it's in the muscle layer, it is appendicitis, right? Second thing for me, there is one organism which can predispose to appendicitis. What organism? Because this can be asked in the micro microscopy as well. Is one organism which can cause appendicitis. I am not talking about Ersinia. Ersinia is pseudo appendicitis. I want one organism which can predispose to appendicitis, which can block the lumen of the appendix. If this is my appendicular lumen, it can just go and block the appendicular lumen and cause all the problems. It's a very, very classical one. Ascar is unlikely to go to appendix. Pinworm. Pinworm appendix is very, very common. Or your entrobius vermicularis, right? A way to remember it's entrobius vermicularis and we have vermiform appendix fine okay so pinworm appendix is very very common so if you have an organism in the option and the clinically see such to appendicitis write a pinworm right okay next finding next question again i wanted to comment it's fine if you make it wrong
okay if you want i'll zoom it a little bit maybe now comment i think the zoomed version is much easier for us because we are used to see all of these in a higher power image right so if it comes in lower power sometimes it might be difficult for us to pick them up now what are these i'm sure now it's a bit easier for us to identify them okay i'll zoom it out now how does it look does it look like an ferruginous body or an asbestos body right that's an asbestos body right so see when you see structures like this you must have seen asbestos bodies like this right all the brown one and the blue one right options are these fine right? yeah c is correct answer right so that's an asbestos body what you're seeing here in this finding is, is a very very low power image that's all right so i want you to get prepared for a low power image as well we, we you cannot have the same image what you see in robins all the time or whatever is being shown by us right uh, my understanding is anything elongated brown color in lung i'm going to call it a ferruginous body only right so because brown color in lung there are only two possibilities first one i have something called as heart failure cells which is also nothing but a hemosiderin laden macrophages hemosiderin will be brown right it's a hemosiderin laden macrophage when i take brown color which will be elongated structure any elongated structure if it is in the lung i want to think of an ferruginous bodies so you should be able to pick up ferruginous on a lower power on a higher power whatever power it is right and my diagnosis here is mesothelioma asbestos related finding one of them which can cause asbestos related finding here is mesothelioma progressive massive fibrosis will be due to coal your shaman bodies will be in uh, your sarcoidosis i don't know why you guys went for sarcoidosis here there is no granuloma here as the only finding you have an aroma pointed as well fine Okay. Next question. Uh, this is a simple one. This is also a gross picture of a lung. Again, have a close look at the lung. There is one characteristic finding, and from that I want you to pick up the diagnosis. Swati Shuman, Shuman body is in sputum is an unlikely finding uh, because it's a finding seen in the giant cells. There are constant concretions of calcium in the giant cell. It's an unlikely finding seen in sputum. Okay. Okay. Guesses here. Autopsy of a person, 34 year old male, and if the patient is not night, what problem would the patient had had in future? That's all. There's a person. Maybe we'll keep the person died due to road traffic accident, right? And a clue for you this is lung the gross surface of lung i am seeing lots of things here tell me what these are there are lots of colored deposit here right in the lung i am having lots of black colored deposit so this is nothing but a coal deposit right so i see a coal finding in the lung it could be normal like you and me my lung also will be laden in coal because we are breathing in polluted air i can also have coal when a person is going to smoke as well right so this possibility, now I am going to rephrase it. Maybe this coal here is due to smoking. Fine. Let's assume this is due to smoking. Now tell me, which of these are risk factors for a smoker on a long term? Let's assume this coal deposit is due to smoking because it's too much more than a normal expected pollution. Fine. Asbestos is not due to smoking, right, Taranjit? This is totally different. Sarcoidosis is not linked with smoking. Asthma, smoke can trigger asthma, but it's not a problem here. And emphysema is a primary problem here, fine. And thank you for being one of the medical world. Okay. Emphysema is a primary problem. Emphysema can be due to a smoking related problem, fine. So emphysema can be triggered to smoking. It can be triggered. It could be etiology for smoking. On a long term, definitely there will be a problem, fine. So this microscopy, uh, the gross finding here shows coal, right? It, um, Panacea or centrius now smoking related. Smoking related problem is generally centrius now, right? Smoking related emphysema will be generally centrius now. Panacea emphysema will be due to alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, right? Alpha one antitrypsin will cause panacea. Great. Okay, fine. For the next finding, the leukemia. I wanted to look at the blast and come to a diagnosis. 
if you come to this diagnosis that should be more than enough it's completely fine we make mistakes and we learn slash Okay, great. We have two of them. Answer is M7. So if it's AML M7, what do you think is the correct diagnosis here? Uh, the answer here. Perfect. The blebs are very, very characteristic here, right? Great, great catch. RNP, I don't think so. That's possible. You can send a request to the An Academy support team. If they can help you with that, I'll be more than happy for that, right? Okay, so here, my diagnosis is totally based on the appearance of the blast. All these are blasts here. If you see a few blasts here, you can see the blebs. When I see blebs in a blast, it's diagnostic of a megakaryo blast and AML M7, right? Because these blebs are nothing but a future forming platelets. Platelets are formed by blebbing of the or pinching of the cytoplasm of the megakaryo site, right? So these are nothing but platelets. Platelets which are being pinched off that gets remained because in precursor cell, right? So it's a megakaryocytic leukemia or an AML M7. When you look at the AML M7, Translocation 122 is a commonest translocation seen in case of AML M7. There are very few informations which I want an undergraduate to know regarding AML M7. One is the translocation 122. Second, it's related to one syndrome. I'm sure you must have known the syndrome. Down syndrome related, right? Fine. The third one you will have in AML M7, you'll have lots of incidents of myelofibrosis, right? There'll be lots of myelofibrosis. That's also a problem in AML M7. Myelofibrosis, Down syndrome, and your translocation 122. These are common points which I want you to know in AML and 7. Right? 922 is seen in CML, the Philadelphia chromosome, which can also be seen in ALL. 1517 translocation is seen in APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia or AML M3. Inversion 16 is seen in AML M4 with eosinophilia. Right? AML M4 with the osteophilia, you can have inversion 16. See, if a question says translocation 16, 16, that is also kind of an inversion 16 only. Fine. Great. EO for eosinophilia. Okay, next finding. I hope you can see the options as well. Okay, comment on this 30 seconds. Okay, answers, guesses. We'll read the question through 62 year old person has told her husband having chest pain and shortly after that collapse, autopsy was performed and there's a finding seen in the kidney. There's a kidney biopsy given. Maybe I'll zoom the kidney biopsy. It might help you to come to a diagnosis. Uh, pan. Okay, we'll look at pan. So the as well as Swati. See this, what structure is this? What structure is this? That's an glomerulus, right? Will pan involve glomerulus? A simple one. Pan will not involve glomerulus, right? So unlikely to be pan here. So if you look at this glomerulus, I'm seeing areas of nodular pink color deposits, right? So a nodular pink color deposits, this is your classical finding of your KW lesion, right? This is your KW lesion, which also is re other name is your nodular glomerulosclerosis. That's actually my nodular glomerulosclerosis. We have nodules of deposits in and around my capillary loop of your glomerulus. Right? That's a classical finding seen in diabetes mellitus. Pan, as I said, that will not involve glomerulus. If I have a biopsy of the renal artery, as pan is much more confident and you can have a diagnosis of that. Hypercholesterolemia, if it involves kidney, you can have two possibilities. It can have an atheroembolus. When I say atheroembolus, you will see the cholesterol clefts in the lumen. Fine. This is the cholesterol clefts in lumen of the uh, uh, renal vessel or I can see and have a normal atherosclerosis and the normal atherosclerosis 
same cholesterol clefts will be seen in the wall of the vessel. So that's the difference between an atheroembolus and an atherosclerosis, right? A systemic hypertension in a biopsy of the kidney, if it's a normal benign hypertension, I have a finding called as a hyaline arteriosclerosis, right? There's a finding seen in systemic normal systemic benign hypertension. You have hyaline arteriosclerosis. Again, hyaline arteriosclerosis will happen in the arteriole and not in the glomerulus. Maybe somewhere the arteriole will be in this part. We'll have the hyaline arteriosclerosis in the hilum of the glomerulus and not in the capillary loop. Fine. Okay. Let's go to the next one and the last one for today. Good evening, PJ Megna. Yes, that's actually the previous image was PA testing. Anti Smith. Okay, any other guesses? Any other answers? Okay, Smith, both of them. Fine, we'll read the question. It's a, yeah, I'll zoom in the image. It's a 41 year old female presents to the family physician. The figure shows the below finding. What do you think will be the disease process here, right? This is the image here. What organ is this? See, if you know the organ, that's more than enough for me for diagnosis, right? Here is kind of close here, right? So what organ do you think is this? The normal structure here. What are you seeing here? And this part as well. These are nothing but my salivary asini, right? So I'm having salivary asini. Now let me leave, rephrase the question. I'm having a salivary gland biopsy with lots of lymphocyte here, which is destroying the salivary gland. My primary diagnosis, lymphocytes destroying salivary gland. My primary diagnosis, it's simple Jogren's syndrome, right? So now in Jogren's syndrome, because your minor salivary gland biopsy is one of the diagnostic finding in Jogren's syndrome, so in Jogren's syndrome, what I'm going to see is your anti-SSC or an anti-SSB antibody, right? Anti-nuclear, anti-double standard DNA, anti-Smith. More or less, I'm going to point to an SLE. An SLE is not going to affect my Jogren's, uh, will not affect my uh, salivary gland. Unlikely to affect it. So option D, anti-SSB or anti-SB is a better answer. Crest is a finding seen in limited systemic sclerosis, not Jogren's syndrome, fine. And in salivary gland, in Jogren's syndrome, Minor salivary gland biopsy is one of the screening tests done. This was asked once. Malaria salivary glands, especially in the lips, right? The lip malaria salivary gland biopsy is diagnostic test or for use for screening of Sjogren's syndrome. And in that, we have a scoring system called as focus score. Focus score, if you have more than one focus score, then my diagnosis of Sjogren's is much more confident in the absence of antibody assay because not every hospital will have the privilege to do an antibody assay. If I don't have the antibody assay, then yes, then yes, focus score is much valuable in the diagnosis of Jogren's syndrome, fine. Okay. Focus score, nothing but you have should have 50 lymphocytes destroying one particular salivary assay, then I would say that that's a single focus. Like that if I have more than one, and my diagnosis of Jogren's is more, more valid, fine. Okay. Okay. So thank you for your time. That's for it for today. We'll be having one more session by tomorrow around 10 o'clock. I'll keep you updated. I'll post the link in the YouTube. We'll, that will be the third uh, IBQ sessions. So we have totally planned for 10 of them. The rest of them will be happening in the Anna Academy app. And I'll post the schedules as well for you for comfort. Fine. So see you soon. Till then, bye-bye from Dr. Anjit. If you have any doubts, you can ask me here. Or you can let me know in the Telegram group or on Instagram. Thank you.